can't believe I can finally say it after nine years and two delays, but Alone in the Dark is finally back. The rumors of its demise have been greatly exaggerated, for it is alive and mostly well. It's alive! Now, it's understandable that people would be dubious that Alone in the Dark is actually good again, based on its wildly uneven history. I'm the fucking universe! But developer Pieces Interactive, whose previous credits include very different projects like Titan Quest expansions of Magicka 2, make their mark on this franchise in style, led by creative director Michael Hedberg, Hi Hebe, Mikael Hedbe, My name is Mikael Hedbe, of Soma and Amnesia the Dark Descent fame, all of whom were given the blessing of none other than the series creator Frederick Renal. For longtime Alone fans, this latest entry is the perfect recipe of weird and wonderful and sometimes pretty janky, which is just so Alone in the Dark, isn't it? Some reviewers have called it a reboot or a remake or a reimagining, but the term that resonates the most with me is celebration. Alone in the Dark 2024 is a celebration of everything the series has ever been, from its most singular triumph to its most unfortunate failures. There's a meticulous attention paid to the series' lore, and so many familiar things are given new life by daring choices. This game took five years to make, and its story has self-aware references woven throughout that explain the difficulty of updating a classic series with faithfulness but also innovation. This game's exactly how series should revive themselves, having fun with the building blocks of the series' core features without simply up old levels and cutscenes. Now, it may not always function as intended, and it can be a little confusing at times, but it's rare to find survival or action horror or whatever you want to call this that enjoys itself this much, and this joy is absolutely infectious as an audience member. But despite being a joy for longtime Alone fans and an accessible entry point for newcomers, this game has been savaged by the game's press, and I think rather unfairly so. So, I've taken it upon myself to play this game nearly four times all the way through to get all the collectibles, all five endings, and experience all three difficulties to bring you what I hope is the most fair and comprehensive take you're going to find on this game on the interwebs. So, you can make a determination for yourself on whether the return of Alone in the Dark is for you. So, grab a light, chamber around, and let's return to Deceto together, because the dark is full of terrors, and it's dangerous to go alone. Alone in the Dark is one of survival horror's most foundational series, so understanding its legacy is essential to appreciating how smartly that Pieces Interactive has honored it. The 1992 original was masterminded by Frederick Renal, a talented animator who put his innovative 3D polygonal models into a world of richly illustrated 2D backgrounds that the player experienced from fixed camera angles which encouraged dread while exploring. The game had two playable protagonists, tank controls, inventory and resource management, head scratching, item centric puzzles, backtracking, and more. Does this sound familiar? It definitely should, and that's because Resident Evil's director Shinji Mikami played Alone in the Dark during a troubling time in Arya's development, when it was floundering as a Doom clone. After he finished Alone in the Dark, Mikami was inspired to completely revamp Resident Evil around Alone's design. I guess you could say Resident Evil went from being a Doom clone to being a clone in the dark. Oh, don't even pretend like you didn't giggle at that. So yeah, Alone in the Dark provided the general framework for 3D survival horror and inspired many design decisions of survival horror's most successful franchise, which is quite a legacy. But Alone started falling from its lofty perch even before it had competition, because it stopped being good at what it did first early on, going for a guns blazing approach in Alone in the Dark 2 that its mechanics couldn't handle, returning to its roots in the somewhat bland third entry, then ironically copying the hell out of Resident evil in the actually pretty good new nightmare, to being ambitious but completely janky in the 2008 sequel, to falling apart completely with the atrocious illumination in 2015 that all but killed the series. Okay, so that's the short version, but if you'd like to hear the full story, you really should check out my Alone in the Dark retrospective video that covers every game and every movie. But what you need to know for now is that Alone in the Dark rose to prominence and then rapidly declined with brief forays into competency here and there. So in order to 
get back in the game, Alone needed to return to its roots, and Pieces Interactive did just that. The protagonists are so much deeper and fleshed out than they were before. Most importantly, Carnby's been updated, who's been more or less an ever-changing costume or attitude that the player could wear more than a person to inhabit. And fuck you anyway! So keeping things classic and reverential to the original, Hedberg wisely writes Carnby as a classic gumshoe detective, rough around the edges with a heart of gold. Carby's voice and facial motion capture actor David Harbour definitely brings the world weariness of his Sheriff Hopper and Hellboy roles to Carnby, and his snarky drawl even reminds me a little bit of Carnby's opening monologue in the original game. The few friends I have call me Carnby. The others call me the reptile. <laughs> My name is Edward Carnby, private investigator. I hope you don't mind we let ourselves inside. But even as improved as Carnby is here, he does feel subordinate to other parts in the narrative at times, even Jodie Comer's Emily Hartwood performance, which is pretty great, like this one scream in particular that chilled my bones. <laughs> Her backstory and motivations are also much more compelling than Carnby's, just like they were in the original, as she's related to Jeremy Hartwood, the game's most tragic character that drives the story forward, just like he did the original. But despite how much better fleshed out and likable the two leads have become, the real star of the show here is the Drusetto Manor, which is both a playground to explore, but also a force of nature that feels decidedly ordinary one moment, and then pregnant with menace and cosmic import the next, as it warps time, space, and sanity around our characters. Hedberg and company seem to recognize, consciously or otherwise, that all of the best alone games, like 1, 2, and The New Nightmare, have taken place in a classic haunted house setup. There is inherent, intuitive storytelling strength in using the logic of architectures to guide players, and this also lets the developers have fun subverting this logic as the house around them shifts like Control's oldest house or the Evil Within games do. And it's important that Dersetto is so interesting while being grounded because it could have been boring as it's a far less fantastical place in many ways than the original house, which had two living gargoyles atop the stairs, an ancient demon in the library, a living suit of armor, and a pirate cave with a possessed tree underneath it. Now, of course, the 2024 game whisks you from wild dreamscapes here and there, but they're outside the house, manifestations of imagination and often very linear and having no map. Dersetto's layout has to make sense, and for far longer, and it's remarkably restrained as it does so. It feels very lived in and filled with the emotional sediment of many different tragedies that have befallen it over the years. Unlike the first game, though, 2024 Dersetto is no longer the inherited home of Jeremy Hartwood, the man whose death by suicide in the original compelled Emily to enlist Kirby's help to come figure out why this happened. In this new game, Dersetto is a mental institution for patients being treated for their disparate mania by the discomforting Dr. Gray. Jeremy sends his niece Emily an alarming letter about what's happening to him here, and she rushes in with Carnby as her backup to get her uncle out of this unhealthy place, which they find has an incredibly dark history that may be contributing to Jeremy's manic episodes, and even worse, things to come. It's a great setup, recalling the original even down to the frog jumping across Emily and Carnby's path as they approach, and I like how the two are now partners, as opposed to individuals who exclude each other from their personal narrative as you're playing. That said, despite being untethered to each other, their playthroughs are mostly similar, cutscenes having some different banter based on whether the residents know Emily from their past visits or are less responsive to Carby's inquisitions as a stranger. There are some cool environmental details like open doors or scenes that you set up in one playthrough that will show up in their final form in another character's playthrough, as if somebody's already been here. This conciseness is probably a smarter use of resources than coming up with wildly different A and B scenarios like you see in Resident Evil, but I was a little disappointed when I saw Carnby and Emily swap places in the original cutscenes so that whichever one you're playing as takes the same route through the basement and the rest of the game instead of showing a distinct path from the front door onwards. I also found it really weird that the main character experiences all the weird stuff while the unplayed character always experiences basically nothing weird and spends the game scoffing at whomever you're playing as. You don't see the very obvious gate leading to whatever Jeremy's madness is serving up next? I don't understand. Are you making some kind of fashion metaphor? I'm sorry, I don't have time for this. Can you just tell me what you're doing? But regardless of who you play, you'll have offbeat, David Lynch-inspired conversations with a colorful cast of weirdo new side characters, all of whom are pretty well acted. 
Funnily enough, no matter how fantastic or horrific things get, only Jeremy seems truly mortified by it. Dorsetto's patients seem almost fascinated by it, and our lead heroes take it in stride like champs, like they've got no other choice. At first, I was even annoyed that no one was commenting on the incredible amount of blood and oil that gets on Emily and Carnby, but then I realized that this was part of the subtle black comedy of it all. The darkness and suffering are hardly new to their Dorsetto patients. It's a tonal balance that's so absurd, it just works. Longtime fans will also recognize and probably appreciate the weird take on Grace Saunders here, the little redheaded girl that was playable in Alone in the Dark 2. She's really strange here, a little dark, and it's pretty enjoyable to see what she'll do next. Now, as enjoyable as this cast is, I do wish they had a little bit more screen time, a little bit more effect on the plot, as they can kind of feel like apparitions more than people who live here because you hardly ever encountered them outside of the occasional cutscene. So again, the character that you come to know the best is Dorsetto itself through just sheer exposure. Pulling you deeper into Dorsetto is the mystery of whether Jeremy's just succumbing to the Hartwood family's predisposition towards melancholy, or whether otherworldly evils are indeed congregating and fighting over the manor's haunted grounds. Now, I'll say less for now as we'll go into full spoilers and story analysis later, but just know that the story is well paced and compelling and goes absolutely bonkers by the end, in mostly the best way. But for now, let's return to Dorsetto, the place of much of the game's charm, and spend some time examining how good the game world looks and feels to be in. Alone has some stellar art direction. It's not showy, but instead leans on attractive lighting and color contrast and composition over preposterously high fidelity. It knows exactly what to do with its budget. And now sure, the supporting cast can look a bit scuffed at times, and Carnby's facial hair can look strange, but he and Emily's models are exquisitely rendered, capturing a good amount of character and nuance in their actors' performances really appreciate the environs the most, though. Dorsetto exudes an old-timey, incredibly lived-in feel. Now, I know I always use this reference, but the greatest example of asset placement that comes to mind is Batman Arkham Asylum, and Alone in the Dark's attention to detail reminds me very favorably of it. Both games do a really good job with the distribution of assets where they're always just off-center and uniquely placed in environments like lamps and mirrors and various assorted crap are draped in cloth and put at different angles to indicate everything here as a unique item with history, not just a collection of assets someone poured into a scene like a box of Legos or clicked copy and paste on a hundred times. I absolutely adore the look of the house and the creativity of the other worlds that you travel to as time and space bend around you, especially the lighting effects. I will say this though, the game's dark areas often look pretty flat, and so, much like Alan Wake 2, the game looks about two to three times better when you turn a flashlight on it and force the game to look better by dialing in a lot more of its effects. The game takes you to plenty of New Orleans themed places too, like the famous above ground graveyards and even the French Quarter. Now, I don't travel much, but New Orleans is by far my favorite vacation spot I've been to, especially the French Quarter. I've stayed in that wonderful old Dauphine Hotel and even went across the street and bought an antique book from the 1800s about Edgar Allan Poe that was written by his rival Rufus Griswold. Now, I love this place and the atmosphere, and Pieces Interactive does a great job peppering the game with realistic New Orleans fare, despite never getting to visit the place physically because of the pandemic. Oh, and before we stop talking visuals, I also want to point out how great the pre-order bonus 1992 original skins are for Emily and Carnby. They work so well with the game's animations and they just look hilarious. What do you make of it? It's nonsense, of course. My only complaint is that outside of the intro, the game's cutscenes only render the 1992 model of the character that you're playing as, not your partner at the same time, which is kind of lame, but either way, they're a great inclusion. Complementing the quality visuals is an equally qualitative dark jazz soundtrack by Arnie Berger Zoega, which feels like a very Nolan's take on Angela Badalamente's Twin Peaks music. The occasional keys or wind instrument wafts clean melodies over a meandering bass line and the rhythmic tish tish of the drums sells the Lynch vibes as the characters speak as if in a dream with a halting noirish edge to their banter. And in other places, like a chase sequence, the music makes the somewhat basic AI of the enemy that you're eluding positively terrifying through sonic context alone. Alone's not a terribly scary game, but when it is, it's almost always because the score and the sound effects are just so affecting. Honestly, the entire sound production is immaculate and punching well above its weight. 
The voice cast is incredibly good too, as we've said, and having lots of fun hamming it up with their spicy Cajun accents, recalling the hokey fun of the original's voice acted journal entries. May God forgive me. Farewell. Paul Mercier of RE4 Leon Kimity fan of RE4's Leon Kimity Kimity? Kimity Ding Dong? What are you talking about? Of RE4 Leon Kennedy fame, does an especially great job with Jeremy's Alan Wake 2 level angst and accent accuracy that is just so 1992 Jeremy Hartwood. No, 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 don't say his name. Now, beyond solid music and voice acting, the guns sound incredibly boomy, and the incidental, very specific sounds of the house shifting or some creature clomping around upstairs will get into your soul in the worst way if you're wearing headphones. <laughs> was that this evening needed some ambiance but the truest joy of Dressetto isn't just its audiovisual pleasures but how you travel through it and interact with it the Resident Evil 2 remake is the modern gold standard of puzzle box map design, gradually unlocking itself more and more as you find items and begin to plan some of your routes intuitively on where certain objective requirements would likely be satisfied, and Alone in the Dark hits many of the same notes. Now, despite lacking objective markers, Alone is a guided experience in a lot of ways, or maybe I should just say it's simply a concise experience. The objective descriptions give you just enough to go on so you're pointed in the right direction or told the room you would probably Probably need to go to to find your answers, and I found the hardest quote unquote old school puzzle setting to be mostly achievable without any help, with two major exceptions. The house is just big enough to feel like you're having to make an actual effort of time and concentration to explore it without feeling like you've lost five to ten minutes if you went the wrong way, which is a really nice balance to achieve. I would echo under the mayor's criticism here though that the map definitely needs to indicate which direction you're facing because I had to do quite a few trial and error attempts to leave a room correctly if it had two or three different ways to exit. Now, as for the house itself, you'll traverse a wooded conservatory with a rather familiar looking tree to those who have played the first game. You'll do creepy things in an infirmary, a journey up to the attic, another lone staple, but mostly you'll be searching cabinets and drawers and safes throughout the living quarters, wine cellar, and other domestic areas for keys, puzzle items, and notes containing clues, and lots and lots of well-voice-acted backstory. You'll also find health vials and lots of bullets stuffed in drawers and chests, which <laughs> I thought was really weird for a mental institution where no one has any guns. Now, normally this kind of thing wouldn't bother me too much, but here it just feels really silly and contrived, especially when trying to believe the house is a real place having fantastic things happen to it and not some video game space designed to help me play a video game better. What's even stranger is that there's this dynamic loot system that only populates areas with supplies if it thinks you're low enough on something. So I spent a lot of time opening up empty crates, which soured what little exploration off the beaten path there was. The system really should have doled out very small amounts of stuff to me for every container versus nothing in most of them, so I didn't waste my time. Notably, playing on hard is probably the most tense experience you'll want to play anyway, and thus the most desirable, and this makes your item drops much more frequent as you're depleted a lot more often, and this makes your search for supplies more anxious and rewarding when you finally get the help. Fortunately, searching for puzzle items is pretty satisfying. Puzzle pieces are rarely too far away from what they go to, but some of the most interesting moments in the game are when you're given really no idea of where to go, and you have to research all the floors of the house to find one random new note you hadn't seen before that informs your current objective. It feels incidental and interesting instead of scripted, and I wish the game went for this approach a bit more than just once or twice. As it stands, though, I don't mind how concise the puzzle piece turnaround time is. I know survival horror fans like to backtrack till their toes bleed, but I'm a little bit more interested in doing the puzzle than I am sweeping the grounds for its pieces in ways that feel more like playing to convention than interesting design. Once you do get your puzzle pieces, they're a good mix of light but engaging to solve. Some puzzles are just pick up the thing and click it to another thing so that some mechanism will work, but some puzzles, like the one in room 6, have a couple steps, requiring a simple matching puzzle to be solved which shows you numbers that correspond to a painting on the wall, and these need to be filtered through a nearby lexicon to figure out what those types of numbers correspond to so that you can open a nearby lock blocks. <laughs> lock box. What are you talking about? So that you can open a nearby lockbox. The steps are simple enough, but there's just enough brain strain here to make it feel like it was a secret you sussed out, and there are a couple other good instances of this as well. There were a couple puzzles, though, that I found a bit obtuse. The first time you're asked to use the talisman, which is kind of this key to the other worlds that you see in the mansion. 
it's rather daunting to understand what you're looking at and what qualifies as correctly inputting the symbols that you see so you can go to your destination. The outer ring of symbols here also seems relevant too to a first time puzzle solver, so that further complicates what your intuition will assume that the puzzle needs you to account for. Another puzzle had a particularly confounding safe combo in it. Since almost all puzzles require you to reference a book you pick up with diagrams and notes, it's weird that one particularly confounding safe combo later on actually came down to a solution that had nothing to do with context clues at all, which is the opposite of what the game had been doing up to this point. Even stranger, the puzzle asks you to count the letters in the words of a riddle, but then also places the exact code you're looking for, so you don't have to solve the riddle, in a very obscured place right underneath the note that you pick up in the first place when you're solving this puzzle. And it's very likely that you're not going to see it because the door swings open just so far. I know I missed this entirely over several playthroughs and had no idea this even existed until Under the Mayo understandably lost his mind about it in his video. This safe puzzle right here is the biggest offender. Fuck this puzzle. There's also a puzzle where you have to zoom in with a telescope, but the only thing you can do is zoom in or out and turn ever so slightly to the right or left. Anytime you do this simple binary control input, you get a totally different output every time. It really doesn't make any sense how it functions and is a real pain in the ass to solve, even four playthroughs in. These hiccups aside though, I generally really like the puzzles. I'm actually quite surprised at how much protesting that major publications made about them, even making me think they were going to be absolutely diabolical in difficulty. Some even complained they were too hard with hints turned on. Other than the ones I mentioned, the rest were extremely doable. I was always excited to test myself whenever I saw a new puzzle, especially when it wasn't just some insert item switch flip. I can't say I was as excited whenever I saw enemies approaching, unfortunately. Alone in the Dark's combat is never terrible by any stretch, and small bursts can actually be pretty fun, but it's definitely a bit loose. You'll start off with a revolver for Carnby and a fast-firing pistol for Emily, and eventually acquire a badass double-barreled shotgun and Tommy gun later on. There are also melee weapons strewn about that break after five or six hits, and there are throwable environmental items like bricks or Molotov cocktails that can set enemies ablaze. Though, curiously, these throwables are stationary and mean that you have to hold down a button and aim to throw them from where you pick them up. I guess the idea was to promote stress and planning as you turn your back to enemies to pick these up and have to aim under duress, which sounds smarter than it actually plays because a lot of them are placed in really bad spots that you never want to get stuck in, but I guess it's alright. The fire effects on the Molotovs especially are really cool and satisfying to see. The shooting's not special, but it does the job. I'm honestly a little tired of every horror game with guns using an over-the-shoulder camera angle, because they all end up looking and playing almost exactly the same. It works, but it's almost a little too well. Alone in the Dark's camera is also pulled too close to the character's right shoulder oftentimes, and the aiming reticle remains high right on screen, and recoil adds a ton of bloom so it can be harder than it needs to be to keep track of and hit enemies who often swing in the opposite direction to your left shoulder but at least the guns sound great and feel great to shoot. Now, the melee is okay, but it really just kind of feels like wildly swinging till everything around you stops moving. Although you can make some effort to guide your swing so that they hit multiple enemies, which was a nice touch. The real problem right now, at least on the Xbox Series X, is that there's a ton of sound delay and input lag when first firing your gun or swinging a melee weapon. The first shot sound effect always happens a full second or so after you pull the trigger, but the rest of the bullets you fire in quick succession are synced like they should be. Carnby especially took three to four button clicks to make him swing his first melee strike and the impact sound was always delayed on the first strike. Emily's gun suffers from the sound lag too, but her pistol is a lot more fast firing than Carnby's revolver and her melee is faster and much less janky. She also sprints very fast in this game too, like way faster than Carnby, which is a funny nod to the original game. So while these aren't all game breaking problems, they can get you killed and they all add up to make combat feel a lot goofier and less satisfying for it, which is too bad because of sound is so good otherwise and the weapon feel is on point. Oh, and while we're talking bugs and glitches, let me just summarize the rest of mine. I had inoffensive stuff like some white tears on the screen if you look around too fast, or weird pauses if you trigger a cutscene, and the game does some crazy looking things to pull characters into the right blocking if you click on stuff without facing it. But the real humdingers were a hard crash, and seven times I got stuck in the environment, five of which required a reload. Now the game saves a lot, so this could have been a lot worse, but it's second only to Alan Wake 2 in terms of sound problems and other jank that I've experienced in modern gaming. 
Now, before we talk enemies and how they act, we do have to talk really quickly about the movement options of the player characters to either avoid combat or to avoid damage within combat. There are short sections where you can hold down a sneak button to get past some enemies, but there's no real indicator of when they'll see you, and ammo so plentiful and combat so scarce anyway that you probably just want to throw down. And if you do decide to throw down, and are finding the combat a bit too hard, just realize that there's an entire dodge move that the game never tutorializes anywhere. I say this having played the game nearly four whole times. I didn't even know a dodge move existed on my first playthrough until I read a review that mentioned it and did a double take before confirming it was so in the menu options. <laughs> there are several sections that you might take quite a while to get past if you didn't know this function existed, and it just blows my mind that it slit Pieces Interactive mind to tell you this was even available. Now, to be clear, there isn't much challenge to combat outside of these control issues. I did die a couple of times on normal, but it was mostly because I got stuck in a corner, which happens with some scripted hordes pinning you down or not knowing that I could dodge, but generally speaking, you light these guys up pretty easily. What's a little strange is that the monsters, which were designed by Guy Davis of BPRD fame, yet another Hellboy connection if David Harbour and the game's nonchalant weirdness weren't enough, some of these enemies look kind of generic and they animate in goofy ways, while some, like this animated corpse thing with an arm made of a torso, is chillingly disgusting. I also love this bat creature that made its way into the prologue and promotional footage several times. What's kind of funny is that the creature's presence is just sort of treated like an incidental because we're playing a horror game occurrence. But not until quite late does the game give you any real narrative justification for exactly what and why they're here. Now, it's not that big of a deal because, you know, it's fun to shoot monsters regardless, but the real buzzkill is how dumb these creatures are or how annoyingly designed they can be. They shamble towards you in these kind of loopy animations, almost begging to be put down, and they inaccurately lunge at you occasionally. These weirdly tough crawling enemies, though, are super glitchy, often being really hard to hit and teleporting around the environment as the game fails to show you their jumping animations properly. I also found it got hit way more often the smarter I played, which is a strange problem to have. <laughs> For some reason, turning your back to dodge almost always got me hit, whereas I could just sort of sidestep and strafe these guys and almost never get damaged. It's almost like if you fight stupid fire with stupid fire, you can make alone in the dark a walk in the park. But I guess this is Pieces Interactive realizing that their combat system was a bit loose and that they didn't need to strain it too hard or it'd be miserable to play, which is more than I can say for most survival or action horror games. Oh, I would recommend playing this game on hard though. Despite what game journalists have said, normal is not the hard of other games here. Like, come on. <laughs> I'm not a difficulty snob, nor do I seek out harder difficulties unless achievements are involved, but hard is the only difficulty that makes combat feel truly tense. You'll have to dodge and reposition yourself way more often because you can't just soak up damage, and enemies that take at least two to three more shots on average to put down, making the fights way more tense and scary. I went from rolling my eyes at enemies to avoiding them whenever possible, and fearing for my life as I drain my ammo reserves, frantically beating them back. Combat here fulfills the role that puzzles play in most games. It's the seasoning for the main course, as the puzzles, exploration, and general atmosphere are the main course here. So that's the pieces of Pieces Interactive's newest Alone in the Dark, but how do they fit together over the course of a playthrough, you might ask? Pretty well as it turns out. The pacing here is especially noteworthy, alternating deftly between story moments, puzzles, combat sequences, and more with cinematic aplomb. The voice acted notes and artistic embellishments of the menus and clue interaction screens ooze the early 20th century charms of the original games. It's an odd and occasionally unnerving game, more about the slow burn and building dread than it is consistent panic and stress over resources. It's much more akin to an action horror game like Dead Space, mechanically speaking. That said, Alone's not afraid to up the ante at times by dipping into body horror, jump scares, tense chase sequences, psychological horror, and even a bit of gore by the end that comes out of nowhere, and it's all the better for it. It's not trying too hard to gross you out or push you around emotionally, while making its dip into grossness all the more affecting when you thought this wasn't that type of experience. I'm a little surprised that Pieces doesn't remake many moments from the earlier games at all. The game's notes and such are rife with references to the old games, but aside from one fixed camera tank control section that recreates three rooms in the original, most of the time, Pieces Interactive is subverting familiar elements into fresh new forms, or actually rendering what was only hinted at in prior games in a note or a line of dialogue. It's something you rarely see because games like this are usually one-to-one -one remakes, or they're very subtractive in their construction, not additive or transformative. Perhaps it's best, though, that Pieces decided to go for broke on their own ideas, even if sometimes they go for broken and janky at the same time. 
One area the game really leans into this transformative referentiality is in the collectibles that are called lanyaps. These are cool little period trinkets like old spectacles or a box of biscuits like you got in the original game to recover health, but they all serve a really cool purpose here. They get organized into sets of three, and when you complete a set, you unlock either some cool background info related to the theme of these items, or you unlock a new item like the shotgun that's in a glass case because survival horror, or even several new objectives that unlock secret endings. How cool is that? These are some of the most fun collectibles I've ever picked up, and they have a ton of personality to them as well, one even being a burnt copy of the first Alone in the Dark retail box. There's a self-awareness and a lightness to the tone of everything that the game does anyway, and this even extends to the story, which these lanyaps often greatly illuminate, or even outright change in the case of the endings. And with that, I think it's absolutely time for us alone stalwarts to dig into the narrative, because it's got a lot of treats for longtime fans, and is a pretty wild and fascinating ride, if a sometimes uneven one. Big ol' spoiler warning, of course, for this game, as well as several other relevant pieces of media like Bioshock Infinite, Shutter Island, and Alan Wake 2. Skip to the timestamp on screen if you'd like to skip to my final impressions and the true value of the product for inquisitive players. So, our story technically starts with the Grace in the Dark prologue, which fans will recognize as a fun callout to Alone in the Dark's promo chapter, Jack in the Dark, in which Grace has to save a captured Santa Claus and escape from a haunted toy store on Halloween night. But Grace in the Dark is way more straightforward, giving us a small taste of the shifting nature of Dorsetto and showing how Jeremy got Grace to sneak his letter into the clerk's office so that it would go out unhindered with the mail and warn his niece Emily that cult activity was going on at Dorsetto and that a mysterious entity is trying to possess him. Fearing for her uncle, Emily rushes over with street smart private investigator Edward Carnby as her backup. We learn from the character's personal effects that Emily has some baggage about a long engagement symbolized by an engagement ring with a note from John Marcus from 1918, which is 12 years ago, indicating something went wrong. Carnby has a note from Obed Morton, a name not unlike Obed Marsh of Lovecraft fame, but also a name which belonged to the anthropologist from New Nightmare. But here, Morton is part of a gang that's pressuring Carnby to repay a debt to them. So, needless to say, we want to keep these two pieces of information in mind because there's nothing survival horror games like more than unpacking trauma. <laughs> Speaking of trauma, we soon meet the colorful cast of people at Dorsetto needing treatment for theirs. We're greeted not so warmly before settling into some uneasy alliances with them, unsure of who to trust. We meet the man in charge, a Dr. Gray, who's snarky and antagonistic towards Emily, whom he's known since Jeremy was admitted and who insists Carmi drink with him, which observant players will maybe raise an eyebrow at in case it's an attempt to drug him or, or maybe even a cruel way to trigger his alcoholism, which we learn about later. There's the housekeeper, Mrs. Thompson, whom we learn turned to voodoo after she met a priestess in the French Quarter. Miss Thompson seems a little too eager for the Feast of St. John coming up, whatever that is. Cassandra Beauregard is a beloved crime author who became crippled and drug addicted after a suicide attempt. She's now trying to finish a movie script called Slaughter Gulch, which is a reference to the setting of Alone in the Dark 3. Cassandra is also the narrator of the game's journal entries, and her writerly persona informs many of the deeper themes we'll touch on shortly. Desetto, the old plantation building was ready to fall. Another artist, the singer Perosi, just showed up one day trying to break into Dorsetto, suffering from amnesia and saying she belonged here, even offering to pay for her stay, as despite being only 33 years old, she was part of the Astarte artist colony here 20 years ago that mysteriously disappeared one day. Dr. Gray finds out that there was indeed a Perosi there at that time, of the same age, but can't figure out how Perosi's story could be true and why she's supposedly impersonating her. The little right-headed girl, Grace Saunders, came from a wealthy family, but hasn't dealt with her father's death yet. Carnby seems to inexplicably recognize her from somewhere, but he can't quite place her. Don't I know you from somewhere? The game even shows its hand a little bit when Carnby meets her later on in the journal updates to say that he should have recognized her based on their shared past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Between this and a missing or dead father, I'm starting to wonder if there's a connection. Adding to this interesting angle is another patient named McCarthy, a drunk ex-lawyer who seems a little bit too interested in where Grace is at all times. He's sort of like a weird mirror of Carnby as the game goes on. Ruth Talon is a former war photographer, now socialite. She's strangely detached from all the schemes going on around the house, but also seemingly more powerful and in touch with how the manor and Jeremy's mind interact, able to navigate the mansion and the fantastic worlds connected to it at a whim. She may not be into much, but she seems a little bit too turned on by all the dark business here. 
The siblings, Lottie and Batiste, have worked here as staff since at least 12 years ago when the place was an influenza hospital. They weirdly attack Emily on sight before recognizing her from previous visits and remain suspicious of Carnby as a detective, letting you know they're probably up to no good. Last but not least of all our characters, Jeremy Hartwood himself is an artist with a possibly overactive imagination, obsessed with a grand design for everything, and feels like he's rejecting basically God himself when he just determines he doesn't want to die yet. He says he's pursued by a haunting figure called the Dark Man, and he's gone into hiding both to escape him and the other members of the house who seem to want Jeremy out of the way, just in time for the coming feast of St. John. There's a growing awareness that something, some female entity, is to be appeased on this otherwise innocuous holiday. We spend most of our time following Jeremy through the house and into these magical worlds using a talisman that acts as a key to unlock the dream worlds that have manifested from Jeremy's imagination and subconscious desire because of the Dark Man's influence. This Dark Man is a play on Ezekiel Prext, the pirate from the first game who was known as the Man in Black and whose spirit haunted the tree beneath the manor and who sought to possess Jeremy's body in order to basically come back into the world, an event that Jeremy killed himself in order to avoid. Similarly, the Dark Man seeks to possess Jeremy and even offers to contain the other Eldritch's presence in the manor in exchange for his soul, presumably that female entity. In this story, though, Jeremy elects not to kill himself to end this nightmare for good, but he also wrestles with whether this is causing more harm than good, and seems strangely aware that by going off script, he has invited doom upon them all. He even references Frederick as somebody that he's sorry he's disappointing, as in Frederick Renault, the creator of the first game. And we read that Jeremy's favorite book about how to act with free will and lead the stage of life is to reject the story a creator is telling. There's a marvelous little meta angle here that we'll get into more later, but for now, all we know is that this may be as real or as deluded as everything else is. So, we follow Jeremy through his dream worlds in hopes of freeing him from the contract that he's made with the Dark Man, a contract that really just looks like one of Dr. Gray's session notes with sections grayed out and consisting of three vague steps as a result. Step one, acknowledge psychological trauma. Step two, break the barriers of self-deceit. And step three, temper manic behavior. So we realize that in order to free Jeremy, we kind of have to act out the steps ourselves. While we're figuring out how to do so, we keep running into the machinations of the other eldritch horror on the premises, or at least that of its devotees. The Dersetto patients are doing everything they can to remove those who would stop the coming of this unknown entity. This doesn't look good. Cassandra Beauregard, despite narrating our journal notes throughout the entire game, has actually been murdered in one of these worlds by the Dosetto patients, and her body left there. The clerk, Mr. Waits, who delivered Jeremy's letter earlier, has also presumably been killed, and we see a brief apparition of him before he goes away. Several other staff have mysteriously gone missing, too. So what are the Dosetto patients preparing for, and how have they become this twisted? Well, we find out that Dersetto has a deranging effect on people and always has over many generations of its existence. The grounds of Dersetto were cleared out back in 1818 by the cultist and farmer Elia Pickford, whom longtime Alone fans will recognize as the alias that the pirate Ezekiel Prext used from the first game. My name is Ezekiel Prext, or Elia Pickford. You may choose which to call me. Elia ran a tobacco and indigo business using slave labor for some time before Union soldier J.W. Norton, also a first game reference, raids the house, but is driven back by this seemingly possessed slaves. Elia is killed in the altercation, though, and the house is kicked around a bit, legally speaking, before being rebuilt and becoming the Astarte artist colony, which Perosi claims she was a part of, and which fans will recognize as being named after the pirate Ezekiel Prexed ship. Am I not Prexed? Captain of the Astarte and bloodiest villain in all the Seven Seas. This elected group of artists got popular for their Mardi Gras celebrations as the Pirates of Pont Chartrand, a fun little reference to the pirates from Alone in the Dark 2. But one day they mysteriously disappear without a trace. Years later, Dersetta would reopen as an emergency hospital for Spanish flu patients, which was doing well until some unearthly rot starts to spread and drive even those cured of the flu into violent murderous rages, and so the entire basement is sealed off to prevent the spread of the infection any further. When you find this out, there's even the slight inference that the events of the game may just be the result of a bad infection causing madness and not anything supernatural at all. But as we go on, we realize that it's much more likely that the Astarte colony didn't just disappear. They sacrificed themselves to a fertility goddess they worship, likely something to do with the cult activity that has gone on here since Elia Pickford. 
After all, the name of their colony Astarte is an ancient Phoenician fertility goddess. Their name Deceto that Pickford chose belongs to a Syrian fertility goddess, and soon we learn the name of the female entity that the Deceto patients are so eager to please, Shub Nagurath, an awkward conjoining of two Arabic words that mean dark young. But not only has this entity been calling out to the patients here, but text you unlock through collecting lanyaps reveals that she has always been calling Carmi throughout his life, even as a child. Unlike Emily, who hears nothing when she walks past the tree, Carmi hears whispers from the great tree in the conservatory. Huh? So you've got at least two proposed eldritch horrors fighting over territory here in the manor and turning most of the people here into their puppets as they try to kill Jeremy to keep him from containing one of them. But despite all this hubbub, the story still wants us to question whether any of this is real or a mass delusion, maybe even caused by the mold or drugs. Remember Dr. Gray insisting that Carmi drink with him? Well, Carmi does so with Ruth Talon several times as well, and Emily even gets stabbed with a syringe at one point, making us wonder if their perception can be trusted with all these drugs in their system. We've already touched on it. That's what she said! But the game introducing the rot is probably not supernatural at all, but it's just a really tough bacterial infection of some kind is also something to consider. Now as for psychological unreliability, we often find ourselves seeming to snap back into reality as if nothing supernatural was just happening. When we're in the steamboat level trying to dislodge it and get it running to symbolically free up Jeremy's mind, we then see Jeremy lamenting that this is not how the story should go to Dr. Gray. And as we're trying to get their attention, Jeremy disappears. And Dr. Gray basically tells us to chill out and <laughs> what's the problem? So many scenes like this exist, but the most troublesome detail is Dercetto's empty room. This is my room. I belong here. No matter who you're playing as, Emily and Carmby both enter this rather abandoned looking room and say this is their room. They even find a message scrawled behind some peeling wallpaper that uncovers a past trauma that they need to deal with, some barriers of self-deceit they need to break. In Emily's case, we find out that John Marcus of 1918 died here of the Spanish flu, and she couldn't bear the sight of her fiancé withering away, and so she abandoned him here, not knowing he died here and been sealed away, but reimagining him as a heroic soldier in World War I who bravely died in battle. Now, of course, this doesn't quite make sense how she could both abandon him here, but also not know he died here. <laughs> But I digress, because some of the plot points seem a little contradictory, possibly even a victim of cut content. But the ironic disconnect is that this causes just as much confusion and madness as the game likes to say is happening here already. Now, for Carnby's case, we flash back a couple of years ago to when he was an alcoholic and when he received his most important case, the reason why he knows Grace. Carnby was hired by Grace's mother, Gabriella to rescue Grace after her father, Teddy, kidnaps her and steals a family painting to fund their escape. Fun fact, Gabriella Saunders is the name of the playable engineer character from Alone in the Dark Illumination. Yet, despite several other characters in that game being descendants of Alone characters, she's not Grace's descendant, despite having the same last name. So I like that Pieces Interactive tidies this up by making the family just like they should have been all along. But back to the flashback, Carnby hits the trail, picking up clues that Teddy Saunders has used the alias Teddy Stryker and it's holed up in a hotel nearby and that he sold the painting to pay for Grace to attend DeWitt boarding school in another state where he's taking her. Two things here. Ted Stryker is the name of Carnby's friend who dies while trying to rescue Grace in Alone in the Dark 2. So I hate that he's become the alias for the actual kidnapper in the game. But Carby does say a weirdly meta thing that I do like, in that he recognizes the Ted Stryker name from somewhere, because if he remembers the original. Something about that name, Ted Stryker, rings a bell. Feels vaguely familiar. Second thing, DeWitt Boarding School gets its name from a note in Alone in the Dark 2 that also mentions a Comstock character. Now, Bioshock Infinite fans will raise an eyebrow here because that game also uses the DeWitt and Comstock names for its hero and villain. And the fact that Alone 2024 is framing the kidnapping slash rescue in much the same way that the Latessas hire Booker DeWitt to retrieve Elizabeth from DeWitt's future self. So all these similarities between these situations made me wonder if writer Mikhail Hebe was having fun with the names being the same and making a double layer meta reference that would make us think there's also going to be some multiverse type shenanigans, especially since we keep seeing mention of the original Alone in the Dark's narrative being known to Jeremy, at least in part, and tormenting him because he thinks he's shirking his fate in that story. But keep all these similarities in mind for now because we'll get into this more soon. 
For now, though, Carnby remembers how he pulled off the daring rescue. He shows up at the art gallery and is bewitched by the painting that Teddy Saunders sold the art dealer named Thornhill. The painting is of a lighthouse and seems to be calling to him, likely Shubnagurath, but also interesting because Jeremy tells Emily that he once painted such a lighthouse, making me wonder if they're the same painting. But speculations aside, Carnby proves that he's not a very nice man at this point in his life, beating the hell out of Thornhill to get Teddy Saunders' location in a nearby hotel. Yeah, but he had principles keeping him from handing out information about his deals, so he needed some convincing. And once Carnby gets into his car to go confront him, he's intercepted by the Morton gang, who are getting impatient about the debt that he owes them. Barely escaping, he makes his way to the bridge and runs Teddy's car off the road and into the water below, which is a crazy thing to do when a young girl you're trying to rescue is in there too. But Carmi, strapped for time and eager to get the girl home for the money, only rescues her from the wreckage and leaves Teddy to drown. This is why Carmi remembers Grace. He rescued her and sent her home to her mother, who was really more worried about the painting than Grace's well-being, which probably indicates why she's here at Dorsetto. So once the empty room gives us this insight into our heroes, we have to ask, did we just Shutter Island this whole thing? Are we just playing around in costumes, pretending to solve a mystery in an asylum that we're actually patients at? I mean, let's be real. The contract of Jeremy's just looks like Dr. Gray's notes with convenient words smudged out, as if Jeremy doctored it into another grand narrative to pursue. Is Jeremy crazy? And not just mentally ill, but also a little bit vindictive in the way he thinks? Are we crazy for playing along? Is any of this real? You can mock me, detective. But you would be the crazy one to think his presence can be ignored. But just like the naturalistic explanations for why this is happening, I don't think there's mostly or any delusion here of the reality warping kind. I think it's all part of a dream logic, with red herrings recalling popular horror tropes meant to, you know, wink at the player, but also keep them off balance just enough till the end to keep them guessing. So let's look at the evidence of why it's unlikely that the game's events are just in our characters' heads. Miss Thompson is angry as hell that they just sort of let themselves in. And Emily is almost killed twice by the siblings Lottie and Batiste, who only know some details of her past like they aren't familiar with her, despite recognizing her as someone who's visited before. What are you doing here? Trying to find my uncle. Jeremy is your uncle? If our heroes, or at least the main character, was a patient here, they wouldn't have much trouble recognizing her, and then they wouldn't temper their violence by going, Oh, yeah, yeah, I know you. Peace. <laughs> One love. Let's also note that Ruth Talon says that Emily isn't nearly crazy enough to be a patient here, so they can't hang out like they'd like to. I wish you were mad as I am. Then you could stay. Give it a few years and I might just be. Carnby and Emily also drive here of their own volition, unassisted and unsupervised. Dr. Gray does seem to know some personal details about Emily because he knows her family, but he's got no such info on Carnby as he would if Carnby were under his care here. You don't happen to have some identification, detective. I'm not keen on having strangers prying into my business. There's also no patient file of him anywhere. Everybody acts suspicious of Carnby and like they kind of know but not quite Emily despite her relation to Jeremy. It's also telling that the empty room gives Emily or Carnby the same flashback treatment as if that's just what the room does. It kind of slots in whoever the person in question is to make them think that I've been here all along. Kind of a high concept escape room to give us their backstory and realize the theme of the story versus a literal room where they stayed. I mean, the room itself looks like it's abandoned anyway, not that anyone's staying here currently. It all feels like Pieces Interactive is just calling our attention to delusion tropes we see all the time in horror media and playing with them a little bit. The real crowning jewel of my everything's mostly as it seems interpretation is the game's standard ending, which is almost identical for both characters. I'm talking chapter five when this all comes to a head in the conservatory. So after we stab and kill a tentacle monster in the eye from one of Jeremy's dream worlds, it's supposed to represent the guardian of his insanity, a kind of self-professed weapon to fight fire with fire, meaning the dark man. We come to and find out that we've actually skewered Jeremy in the eye, giving him a lobotomy. Guess we did kill his insanity after all, but we're also told that in our struggle against the Dark Man shortly after, that we were really just attacking Dr. Gray. So, was any of this a delusion that we just played along with, because we we're losing it too? Or is there more to it? I think we find out soon. We see the residents of Grisetto gathered around the conservatory tree for the Feast of St. John, that they seem a little too anxious to not just celebrate the new year, but to recite a chant they've come up with to appease the female entity we've been reading about. But then they kind of want to sacrifice Grace, the object of Carnby's redemption arc, and so you and even Emily and her campaign attempt to save Grace from this horrible ritual. 
Batiste will try and intervene, and whichever character you're not playing as will shoot him in the back of the leg and throw a Molotov onto the tree to break up the ritual, recalling how you throw your lantern at the possessed tree in the original game's final boss fight. But the greatest subversion of all is the tree reacting to this attack by becoming a giant tentacle monster with goat hooves known as the Black Goat of the Woods, an avatar or a manifestation of Shubna Garoth herself. In a glorious tonal switch, she kills nearly everyone in the hall, ripping them limb from limb and just storms off. We meet her in the grand parlor and show her a parlor trick of our own called Make the Buckshot Disappear Up Her Ass. It's... it's gone blowing her to smithereens as Dersetto burns down around us and buries this horrible event beneath the ashes. I'd say it's pretty hard to argue around the fact that shooting an eldritch god to death was all in your head, and the two secret bad endings are in the same canon as this one. So let's check them out real quick. The two secret endings, one for Emily and one for Carnby, confirm that this cycle would have repeated entirely if they'd given in to their respective tormentors. In Emily's radical acceptance ending, she gives into the Dark Man and is seen with Ruth and Grace and some masked figures inside the sunken temple where we found the contract, symbolizing that she's now in a memory world owned by the Dark Man, totally lost under his sway. Because the game stops here before we've had a chance to see the Black Goat summoned, we can infer that the Dark Man deal will keep her from arising just like Jeremy said it would. Grace being here indicates that she wasn't sacrificed and Shubna Gurath has likely been contained. In Carnby's Join a Cult ending, he gives in to the voice of Shubna Gurath that's been calling to him for years. The whispers became more common as he moved to New Orleans, but still rare enough to be ignored. Now as he walks the halls of Darseto, he knows what is calling him. He doesn't want to admit it, but the dark young in the conservatory is telling him to sacrifice the Cabri San Corn. In this ending, Carnby stops trying to save Grace from being hung and gives in to the madness, saying that he realizes that he's been Shubna Gareth's instrument this whole time, that he needed to break the Dark Man's pact and imprisoned her in exchange for Jeremy's soul, and she needed him to bring Grace to her as a sacrifice, the Cabri San Corn, or the Goat Without Horns. All of the residents, even Dr. Gray, gather around to show solidarity, and Carnby bellows that she'd better run. Emily gets stopped to the car, but comically Ruth is already there waiting on her, somehow teleporting from the conservatory to here after being super into the ceremony. Okay then. They drive away and we fade to black. What's also kind of interesting about this ending is that Ruth hiding in the background may actually be the point of her character and reveal her true intentions throughout. She tells Carnby that it's somewhat shameful of Jeremy to break his promise to the Dark Man, and then shows him the hand sign of submission to the Dark Man that Emily uses in her ending, as if to lay on the point rather thickly. She's also present in the Radical Acceptance ending, and her allegiance is to, or at least the most piqued by the Dark Man. If an all-powerful entity showed me any interest, I'd at least hear him out. I'm sure he has plenty to offer. Subtle, but consistent, right? Some might even say she's an avatar of the Dark Man, as she can whisk Carnby or Emily to the docks on a whim. Her nonchalance is likely because of her power. Now, maybe she's just a dabbler turned on by power wherever she can find it, but I gotta say, her ambivalence is a really fun canvas to paint theories on. Okay, so that's three major ending branches that all operate under the same logic. The Dark Man will contain Shubna Gareth if obeyed, or at least the Black Goat, and if not, she wins. But if we've discounted all the other red herrings that try to say it's all a dream or just a reaction to some physical malady, then what's left? Well, remember, we've been hinting at a meta-narrative, or perhaps even a multiverse, this whole time. Jeremy laments over and over again that the events of the game are not happening as they should even after he's been lobotomized and sees Dracetto burning in the evil vanquished. Everything is out of order. This isn't the way the story goes. I shouldn't be alive. Yeah. Oh, you're welcome, buddy. Now, this implies a valid counter-narrative is out there somewhere. One that has facts in common with the 1992 original, where Jeremy hangs himself before the events of the game, instead of surviving as he does in the 2024 game. Adding to the intrigue is the forbidden text you read in the Heartwood Curse Laniap set. The Heartwood Curse is what they call it. The Heartwoods carry a troubling chemical imbalance in their brain, which they have managed to pass down through generations. As they grow old, they are overtaken by overwhelming melancholy that unavoidably leads to suicide. Oh, you want the real story? Well, who can say? It was written that way. There's some irony here because Renal was involved with this project, or at least gave it his blessing. So this doesn't sound like a dig at his handling of the first game. So I turn to the character Cassandra Beauregard for narrative enlightenment. 
So I didn't notice this until I went back in and started editing, but Grace in the Dark actually begins with Grace tearing up a manuscript for her paper mache mask she's making, a manuscript called Alone in the Dark by Cassandra Beauregard. This isn't referenced anywhere else in the game, strangely enough, but it seems pretty damn important because we get to see the first page which reads, Jeremy Hartwood had hung himself in the attic inside cursed Dorsetto. There was little struggle as his life was slowly strangled from his body. He knew it had to be done. There was no choice. This was his only escape. People acted shocked, but there was no surprise. The old house was cursed by something very old that had walked in one stormy night and settled there. Such ancient things have no names, only descriptions. The figure stood opaque by the fireplace as Jeremy pretended to sleep. Now, the rest of the script is too hard to make out, save a couple words, but seems to be chronicling the dark man visiting Jeremy and driving him to the act of hanging himself. So why she has even created a script about Jeremy that's bearing the name of the game is almost too meta to be understood in my opinion. The idea is so big that any theory kind of fits inside it and nothing really stands out or fits any better than the rest. And especially since this was in the promo, this may just be a fun bit of fan service. I'm not quite sure. But because of this, I'm opting to believe that Pieces Interactive's intent here is to be more symbolic. To say something about the canon of Alone in the Dark lore and what it means for them as a real world creative force to change and modify that lore and what repercussions and responsibilities that bears and we'll talk more about that soon in detail. For now, what's important is that this script provides metaphysical justification for why Jeremy would feel like his destiny is tied to this act of hanging himself. Cassandra's cosmic role as a creative force herself seems to be so powerful that she becomes a target for the chaotic forces inside the manor. An image of a dead woman stabbed with hat pins splashed inside his mind. The fact that she's updating your journal notes and narrating them is, is intentionally illogical because it's not supposed to make sense. She's merely the chorus now, the concept of a writer kind of gone on to do the same in the afterlife and thus fulfilling this role regardless of her state of being. Her seemingly impossible state of being also plays into the note titled The Death of the Author, which reflects on her death and function. What did you expect from them? You created too much. There wasn't any room to breathe. Your reification rendered all possible worlds void. You took everything they could imagine and constrained it into something that you didn't even care about. Or maybe you did. Perhaps you cared the most of all. Maybe you tried to save them from themselves, and that is why you had to die. The rigidity of a writer's mind to find the story and then stick to it to earn its drama is a metaphor for her resisting the mass delusion narrative of her DeSeto neighbors. And because she gets in the way of the plot, she must be removed. So, on the one hand, we have a note that says, who can you really believe? It's what's on the page, but I don't trust it. And then we have someone pushing a narrative that's in killed off, as if the rigidity of source material or an ideal of the best original narrative is out there pushing down on creatives, trying to make something original and creatively fulfilling while still being reverential to the source material. Much like Pieces Interactive could be feeling during their long five-year development on a series with a lot of history and very unlike anything they'd ever made before. Yeah, for sure. After all, the death of the author referenced here is a literary theory that says readers should read a story and not take the author's biases into account when interpreting it. Should treat it as a world unto itself that's like those disclaimers you see at the beginning of movies, you know, where any similarities to real people is incidental. But here it's saying, trust the characters and immerse yourself in this story's values and message and don't presume that the author is always pushing their narrative, their belief system. Oh yeah, I kind of just gave up on worrying about that. Now, this has its advantages as a theory because it means that we're not looking to blame the author for every bad thing or assume that they believe it just because it's part of the story. Like, if a murder happens, we don't automatically assume that the writer is a murderer or loves murder, and that's why they include it. <laughs> But the danger of this theory is that we can miss when an author is perhaps failing to earn their drama by contriving circumstances to fit the aspirational way they think the world should work, like a confirmation bias. Take Lovecraft, for example. He's well known for having racial and cultural prejudices, and it's easy to assume that at least some of his beliefs inspired the scary unknowableness of the ultimate foreigner, the monsters that populate his stories. But if we truly believed in the death of the author theory, we couldn't make that claim at all that his beliefs influenced his stories. But we know intuitively that at least some of the author remains in their stories, that everyone preaches from their place of bias, even down to the chosen subject to write about in the first place, even if no wild claims are being made about the subject. Is that supposed to make you seem attentive or intelligent? Whatever you prefer. 
Okay, so what does all of this have to do with Alone in the Dark? Well, let's turn to Jeremy's favorite book, The Power of the Verb in Certain Texts by Juan Jorge, that we see Jeremy holding in that self-portrait that Emily and Carmen we find early on. The book's so influential on Jeremy's thinking that when we visit the manifestation of his inner peace in the Mexican Library of Terawea, a kind of embodiment of Juan Jorge is there to help us understand the metaphysical rules of these dream worlds and how to help Jeremy. So let's dig into what made such an impression on Jeremy and how it relates to the meta-narrative. To act is in itself divine. True divinity is found in the choice of leaving the stage where we all perform. People who discover this freedom unexpectedly will be struck by the terror of this revelation and become paralyzed, or worse, turn to suicide. However, if you are able to weather that storm, you will discover that there is a divine path beyond that fear. There is a chance to dismount your destiny and make something new, something that hasn't been planned for or predestined. Leaving the stage, no matter how, isn't a matter of course correction. It's a rejection of the story that the creator is telling. In keeping with this idea, there's an attic scene we unlock through Lanyap Collection that shows Jeremy doing just this thing, and is the source of much consternation throughout the game. In the original story, Jeremy hangs himself to avoid possession, and Emily and Carmby come to investigate why. In the 2024 game, Jeremy is considering doing the same thing to avoid succumbing to the Dark Man, but he pulls up short and asks what would happen if he simply didn't fall in line with the presumed narrative from this unknown place. Would the world and all sense and reason fall apart, or would things simply fall in line with the new story in which he lives? Confident that he's doing what's best for him, he leaves the news hanging and apologizes to Frederick for going off script. This is a wink at the audience, as Frederick is clearly Frederick Renal, the god of the first game's world, if you will. Now, I don't think we need to worry too much about why Jeremy, the character, knows Frederick exists, but more so what he represents as an avatar of the first game's legacy in light of Pieces Interactive's remake or reimagining or celebration, right? Jeremy is Pieces Interactive, able to open worlds of imagination and responsible for most everything that goes on here in some sense. I don't think it's any mistake that Jeremy is a sculptor and a painter, an artist, just like Pieces Interactive. Jeremy's desire for divinely ordained narratives and the sanity fault he has when they don't go according to plan feels like a metaphor for the struggle of what was a very long creative process for Pieces, and what is even in its concise final form, a fairly dense and layered bit of fan service that took, you know, Gosh, what, over an hour to talk about, right? At first, I was frustrated by this meta aspect because it didn't make very much sense in world, and my recent playthroughs of the very popular Alan Wake 2 had me thinking in terms of those kind of rules. It was out of control. But I don't think Alone's commentary on the creative process, and especially in terms of reimagining something, is really the point. And trying to do that creates more problems than it solves. Just like Juan's text said, Jeremy's newfound freedom as an independent actor doesn't come without repercussions. It leads to madness in most cases, this overwhelming freedom that's too much for many people. But the text promises that the possibility is also there to forge a new path of your own making that will be paradoxically freeing, but also possibly one of great antagonism as you're rejecting the creator as a character in their story. Thinking about this meta-narrative through Pieces Interactive's eyes helps us glean helpful and healing commentary on finding one's voice in the creative process. In the Lanyap set called All the Worlds a Stage, we see this message. Life is a stage play performed to no one, applauded by no one, and wanted by no one. A story already written, meant to play out in one way only. I wrote my book in order to explain that there might be more to life. That free will isn't truly free unless it moves against the expected. In retrospect, I think my ambition was hubristic. Yermi had a much more humble suggestion. What if we all just went home? Now, the title of this landing set obviously refers to Shakespeare's famous line about how all the world's a stage and we are all merely actors. But it, along with other texts in the game, directly reference the major terms free will and predestination from the theological argument between Arminians and Calvinists dating back to the 1500s. In this theological showdown, John Calvin was a Presbyterian theologian that taught that man's destiny was predetermined by God, non-believers to hell, and believers to heaven, and it was ultimately up to God to affect someone's salvation because men, being who they are, would never actively choose him. So deeply did they love their sin, even against their own best interest. Jacobus Arminius's contention was that in order for man to be truly free and not just a robot responding to programming, he had to have some say in whether he chose God, some autonomy. 
So were we to assume Jeremy is an Arminian because he exercises his free will to reject the predetermined storyline as set out by the 1992 original? <laughs> Unlikely. But the results of his actions do suggest a peril in being as free as someone like an Arminius would suggest. That going off script and playing God may result in the destruction of the world as we know it. But Jeremy is more than just an example of this point. He's a picture of Pieces Interactive, both acting as a free will actor, subordinate to expectations and the nostalgia of fans, but also having to play the new god of Alone in the Dark, taking risks to create a new world that references an old one where Renal played god. Pieces Interactive could be saying here that they couldn't be truly free themselves unless they break away from a one-to-one -one update of the old game and branch out into a respectful and referential experience to the originals, but also something that is able to stand on its own two feet by itself, artistically speaking. In short, they'd have to move against the expected in order to be truly free. I've even lamented in this review that there weren't more callbacks to the original scenarios, simply because I think it'd be fun. But I have to commend Pieces Interactive on taking the hard road and making something that always feels like it fits in the Alone in the Dark world without leaning on nostalgia to make it feel like it's working. But this commentary doesn't account for the last line of All the Worlds a Stage about how this approach might have been prideful, and notes that Jeremy very reasonably suggests that what if we all just left the stage, left the rat race, and went home, foregoing the struggle altogether, quit trying to play to type or even worrying about type, quit worrying about who we're supposed to be, narratively speaking. The great illustration of this idea is actually found in the most unique secret ending called the What Just Happened ending. Unlike Join a Cult and Radical Acceptance, which show us the natural extension of what would happen if Emily and Carmby went crazy and gave in to the horrors of Dossetto instead of putting them down, what just happened lives up to its name and totally flips the script. Now, it's probably important too that this Laniap set is made up of three obvious callbacks to the original game, from the napkin that looks like the blanket you put over the painting that's throwing axes at you, to the talisman, to the box of biscuits health item. It's like it's intentionally subverting the familiarity of these trinkets. So the ending starts off with Grace playing with the talisman and then Carmby and Emily come out of what turns out to be a play going on inside a theater. Emily says it's gone on for too long, so they decide to leave commenting that it would have been much more interesting with the hedge maze and pirates, which is a fun on-the-nose reference to Alone in the Dark too. Kirby even makes a dad joke about how confused the play left him. Let's just say there were moments where it uh, left me alone in the dark. <laughs> oh, God. That's the name of the play. Whoa, what do you know? Okay, so what does this all mean? Well, in the 2024 game, the talisman is essentially a key between worlds made up of imagination and intent. And so Grace playing with the talisman indicates a kind of ritual in and of itself that we are traveling into another world or traveling out of another story. We then see the roles of everyone kind of condensed down where surrogate father and protector Carnby in the main story is now Grace's real father and Emily, her mother now. They both step out of what we'll recognize at the Black Pharaoh Theater where the Dark Man first showed himself to Jeremy, a place we actually visit in game. We learn that inside the theater, a play called Alone in the Dark is being performed and that it's been going on for hours and is a bit confusing, a wry little bit of self-deprecation. Then we get some humor showing their knowledge and appreciation for the older games as they leave the theater. Some have characterized this as the equivalent of the dog ending in Silent Hill 2, a joke ending so divorced from the tone of the main game as to be seen as just for fun. But there's too much here in this ending for Alone in the Dark that's in keeping with the game's themes we've been talking about. For one, the fact that they're watching a play with the game's name makes me think that this is sort of an abstract ideal or microcosm of everything that Alone in the Dark is, a living testament to it. This sounds like an even more powerful version of the call to leave the stage that Juan Jorge proposed. In this ending, Grace is bored and asks if they can just go home, echoing Jeremy's sentiment earlier about what if we all just went home? Can we go home? Yes, please, can we? What, you guys didn't like the play? So perhaps the true freedom isn't in finding out your place in the story as is, getting caught up in the expectations of what should or shouldn't be, but in simply removing yourself from the process altogether. Having trouble finding your voice as a character in Alone in the Dark, or a developer tasked with making a sequel to a series with tons of history and baggage? Well, become an audience member, go to the play, and leave the stage fright behind. As Juan says, free will isn't free unless it goes against the unexpected. Pieces pulled out all the stops to subvert the familiar and transform what we thought we knew into fascinating new shapes. Juan Jorge's book tells us that the noblest and most powerful course for Pieces Interactive to pursue in the situation is to merely act and to act confidently, without consideration for self-doubt, fan expectations, or the conventions of remakes. 
Imitation may be the sincerest form of flattery, but perhaps innovation that still recalls the spirit of the original is an even higher goal, if not one fraught with self-doubt and the struggle to know when you're on the right track. All that to say, the meta elements of the game don't convince me that the pieces interactive is committing to a mini worlds theory or some grand meta narrative that we need to figure out and how it relates to the actual lore of the story. You know, there aren't various alone in the darks out there waiting to be seen by the characters, but rather a sort of metaphorical playground that illustrates how self-delusion works for the characters struggling with their mental health, but also the developers as they piece together how to go about making a project that's worthy of the name Alone in the Dark without being shackled to its conventions, one that feels truly free to be whatever it needs to be. And that's Alone in the Dark 2024's greatest contribution to the survival or action horror genre. It's belief in itself and its incredible alchemy of being both highly original while nostalgically rewarding for the careful eyed fan, especially when it could have easily just been another disaster and no one would have been surprised based on the series history. So yeah man, that's Pieces Interactive's take on Alone in the Dark, and I can confidently say that it's one of the best games in the series, by far. This Alone in the Dark revival is as good as we could have possibly hoped for, and a lot better than I expected it to be. Oh jeez, just perfect. It's a smaller project, and while it does great work inside that limitation, occasionally it does resemble its budget and technical prowess and fall apart a little bit, but isn't that just like Alone in the Dark? Now, as for the game's value, some people have said that the price is steep at 60 bucks for the regular edition and 70 if you're getting the deluxe edition, but 60 for the base game is already $10 less than the new average that the game sells for now, and I found I got much more than my money's worth through encouraged playthroughs of a game that I just really enjoyed. Trust me. You're getting your money's worth. At this rate, I'm an absolute bargain. Alone's punching well above its weight in the visuals department, and it's got great music and voice acting. Its puzzles will never destroy your brain, but several are pretty fun to figure out, and the pace is never wasting your time wandering around forever trying to figure out what piece you're missing or what moon logic you're not getting yet. Alone in the Dark knows exactly when to leave the stage and not overstay its welcome. It even incentivizes you to come back with collectibles that can only be found if you play both campaigns, and then you're able to start unlocking all those cool secret endings we talked about. And because it's such a tidy, accessible, and engaging experience with tangible rewards, I was always pleased to keep going back in. I did play this game four times within a week for this review, and it was only like the last playthrough I was killing. Okay, I could take a break from this game for a while. So just like Alone in the Dark has always trudged on against the odds, so too will I stand up for this entry amidst a sea of bad takes and frankly rather impressive competition in its genre. There's just so much to like here. We'd be really wise to support it and champion it as fans of the genre and of games that know what they want to be and are not afraid to be a little risky, sometimes even to a fault. Alone in the Dark is also a really special game in the history of the art form because it does what most remakes or remake adjacent games fail to do or simply don't attempt. Make something feel familiar and honorific enough to be nostalgic and reaffirming, but also brave and bold enough to take the original as a jumping off point to go into new places the original only hinted at. That's a treat and a blessing for anyone who's really paid attention to the series. So here's to Alone in the Dark returning in sumptuous fashion, and who knows? Maybe it'll do well enough that there will be even more down the line. Well, maybe next time. Looking forward to it. Safe returns. Thanks for watching. And a huge shout out to those of you generous enough to support my work by subscribing to my Patreon. I have to thank Mark Newbauer, Dead Forge, Hey Blondie, He Act Show, and M for their contributions. And a special thanks to The Nth Review and James Wyatt for subscribing to my Patreon's highest tier. If you'd like to be part of the reason this channel gets bigger and better, feel free to go over to patreon.com forward slash high functioning medium, or you can become a YouTube channel member, or if you prefer, you can donate to Kofi. Also check out my GOG and NordVPN affiliate links to contribute to the channel with no cost to you. God bless you, everyone, and I'll see you soon.